As far as today's message, know your enemy, know his plan. Know your enemy and know his plan. This is a big deal in the military. It's, it's known as recon, going out on a reconnaissance mission. You're going out to gather intel. If you're going into another military's base to see where their, where their strongholds are at, where they've got their defenses, what kind of defenses they have, what kind of artillery they have, where their secret bunkers, where they're keeping the most powerful people, so on and so forth. There's a lot to it. But the goal of a recon mission is to go and get and acquire all of the information that you can about your enemy. So we need to know our enemy and we need to know their plan. First Peter 5, 8 says, be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Do we understand that the devil can only operate in what we give him to operate? The power of Satan is in what we give him to have power. He only operates where we allow it, how we allow it. The power that he has is limited to the power that we give him in our lives. Who in here has made the mistake of, of giving the devil a foothold in their life? Ever before. It happens. These footholds come forward through our words and through our actions. We give them a foothold through the things that we do. If we're stepping outside of the will of God and we're doing something we shouldn't be doing and we know it, we just gave him a foothold. We have given him permission to be there and to operate in our lives, and we grant him power when we do it. 1 John 3 8 says, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So, we all slip up, right? Who in here has slipped up and sinned? If every, every, every hand. This is talking about whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. This is where your foothold stops being a foothold and it turns into a stronghold. This isn't just... Walk in your normal Christian life, trying to walk in faith, trying to walk in the will of God, and someone cuts you off and you mess up and you sin. This is day in, day out. This is my life. This is how I'm going to live it. And he, he's, a, he's then able to establish a stronghold. Not a little foothold, but a stronghold. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That should bring comfort to us, right? How many of us have ever sat there on the pity party bus and said, I'm the only one that's ever gone through this? No one's ever been here. No one knows what it feels like to be me. Why, why would God let this happen? No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. If you are going through something, someone else has gone through it. It is common. Who in here has made the mistake of thinking that they have gone through something that nobody else has ever gone through. I've been there. I've whined about it. I've complained. And what do we do when we send up those prayers? That ain't a prayer. That's complaint layaway. 
God, why are you doing this to me? What I do? I can't handle it. You can. The Word tells us. The Word reassures us that it is common to man, number one. We're not alone. That's why he gives us the body of Christ so that we have somebody to draw strength from. We have someone to pray for us. But on top of that, it says God is faithful and will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. It's when we step out of that ability in the will and the escape that he gives us that we start letting the devil establish footholds in our lives or strongholds in our lives. God will not let us go through something that we cannot handle. I was talking with Corbin a little bit this week. I talked with his basketball team this week. If, if your you know, summer basketball practice is not necessarily about getting better as a ball handler, as a scorer, as a passer, it's about nothing but getting in shape. These kids have not been in school in six, seven months, and I promise you there's a lot of work to do. What I've told people when they start quitting is if you quit every time you hit your limit and you never push past that, your limit's going to stay your limit. It is the same with us, just like we talked about earlier with the testing of our faith. That faith never gets stronger if it's never tested. We, right here, that you may be able to endure it. Our endurance is going to get greater when we are tested in this. When we're given temptation and we fall to it, yeah, we failed. It happens. Sinners. But when we see that temptation over and over and over and we start to resist and we plant ourselves strongly in the word of God and his will and we look for his escape, we look for his word, we draw from his strength, we get a little bit stronger. We get a little bit more endurance in it. We just need to open our eyes and we need to see and realize God in the midst of what we're going through, in the midst of our temptation, in the midst of our failing and his forgiveness. We've got to realize him and see him and seek him. I heard a neat quote this week from Randy Robinson. It says, our deliverance lies in the staying close to the one who is our deliverer. I'm going to say it again because I, I love that, and that, that helps us with all this. Our deliverance lies in staying close to the one who is our deliverer. If you've got an alcohol problem, is it a good idea to go hang out with all your buddies who drink beer every night when they get home? No, and for anyone who said yes, wow, you're completely wrong. Pretty sure I heard a little smart aleck yes somewhere, so I just, I'll just i not publicly out someone, but I will just tell you you're wrong. If you're an alcoholic and you have a drinking problem, it's probably a good idea to go hang out with people who don't drink at all. Where That, that temptation's not going to come up. It, the word says he gives us an escape from that. It's, it's a pretty easy escape to, I mean, that's pretty, that's as easy as it gets. You've got a group of buddies that drinks, you've got a buddies, group of buddies that doesn't drink. Don't hang out with the ones that drink if you're trying to quit drinking. If we would think about these situations and think about these areas of sin in our lives where we struggle with this and we'd break it down to that fundamental left or right, It'd be a lot easier, but it makes it that much easier to stay next to our deliverer. Let's look in the, in the word at Leviticus chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 33. We'll go to verse 42. We're going to start in verse 33. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When you come into the land of Canaan, which I give you for a possession, and I put a case of leprous disease in a house in the land of your possession, then he who owns the house shall come and tell the priest, There seems to me to be some case of disease in my house. Then the priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest goes in to examine the disease. 
lest all that is in the house be declared unclean. And afterward, the priest shall go in to see the house. And he, ha he shall examine the disease. And if the disease is in the walls of the house with greenish or reddish spots, and if it appears to be deeper than the surface, then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut up the house seven days. And if the priest shall come again on the seventh day and look, and the disease has spread in the walls of the house, then the priest shall command that they take out the stones in which is the disease and throw them into an unclean place outside the city. And he shall have the inside of the house scraped all around in the plaster that they scrape off, they shall pour out in an unclean place outside the city. Then they shall take other stones and put them in the place of those stones, and he shall take the other plaster and plaster the house. put somebody on the spot, not big, just, just your thoughts. What, what do you think when you hear that, that passage? God, you, you're not going to be wrong. God gave me multiple things to work out through this passage, but what comes to your mind? Growth of mold, fungus, and when you, you do a good Bible study, that, that's what it's talking about. Do we have anything in our house that we shouldn't? Parts of today are going to seem silly, but they're going to seem silly to people who have earthly sets of eyes and don't realize that we're in a spiritual battle. The battle's spiritual. It's not earthly. If we'll think in terms like that, today's message is going to make a lot more sense. Do we have anything in our house that we shouldn't? And a lot of times it's little trinket things that were, but let, let's just take it down really, really basic. Movies, music, games. Do we have a book that we shouldn't have in our house? A painting, some little trinket that someone gave us, something like that. I mean, I know this, honestly, this seems kind of silly. It's not. The first. The further me and Kimberly got in our Christian walk together, the, the more we were like, you know what? We, we don't need to have rated our movies in our house. That This is something that we shouldn't have. There's certain kinds of music that we shouldn't listen to. These, these things that we may seem are silly are very possibly the things that may be inviting and giving power and authority to Satan in our lives. So when you think about it in that context, it's not very silly. Have you ever walked into a house and got that feeling? That weird, bad, eerie feeling? Anyone? Ask, asking questions, hoping for responses. I don't want to break another horn in the speaker. Y'all wake up, help out. And, and I understand, and that's, that's what we're talking about right now. We need to be praying over our homes. We need to anoint our homes, and we need to protect our homes. We cannot allow, I don't care if you come off mean or ugly or nasty. Me and Kimberly, I remember one time early in our marriage, we had family over, and we walked into the house together. We didn't have kids yet. We walked into the house, and they had invited someone in our house that they didn't let us know. This person was doing something that they didn't need to be doing. And I somewhat kindly asked them to get out of my house. I wasn't going to have it. And I told, uh, and I let them know, don't, don't let that happen again. If you're going to be in my house, you're not going to invite things like that into my house. That, that's that's another part of stewardship. God blessed me to have that house. I'm going to glorify him with it. And if there's anything in there that's not glorifying him, it needs gone. And I don't care if I sound mean about it. It's his. He gave it to me. What am I doing with it? It's the same with our cars. It's the same with anything. 
Is there anything we need to eliminate? Is there anything we need to get rid of? I went to help someone move the, earlier this year, sometime this year, with all the coronavirus. This whole year is just a big dumpster fire. But I went to help a person move, and I walked in and immediately, I mean, I felt like I crossed a threshold, and it was awful. And I just, in my head, just started praying because I still, I, you know, I want to help, help out, but it was, it was awful. And I get to loading stuff into boxes, into Tupperware stuff, and I get to the movies, and I start realizing, like, these weren't just, you know, Friday the 13th or you know, whatever the name of the Jason movies are. That may be Friday the 13th. I don't know. Okay. Or Nightmare on Elm Street. Th this wasn't like your popular, you know, bad movies. There there was stuff, it like, named I Spit on Your Grave. Like, j I, I mean, like, horrible, horrible titled stuff. And, like, you flip over the back of it and you're like, Wow, there's some stuff going on in here. My helping someone move went from this gentle, organized to like set a box down right here. Throw it in. I'm getting out of here as quick as possible. I'm saying my prayers the whole time I'm doing it. It's there there's a reason there's a bad feeling. Something has been invited into that house. Something has been given authority and power to operate. Do we have anything like that in our houses that we don't even realize? Do we have stuff in our houses like that that we do realize, but we just make a choice to go ahead and accept it? Do we have anything in our lives that we need to eliminate? Not our house, but our lives. Is there something we're doing that we overlook, that we've become numb to, that we've gotten complacent in? Are we doing things that we shouldn't be doing? Have we gotten too busy to realize it? Has it just become a part of the norm? Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect. This is just as big a part of it as our houses. The way that we act. The way that we live our day-to-day -day lives. If I know I have a road rage problem, which I do, and I spend all day on the road, I'm sitting here talking to you about avoiding temptation. One of my biggest temptations is road rage, and I do it every day. So, can't, you know, can't help it. But, what, what in our lives can we eliminate? Because what does the word say? He, it doesn't just say stop sinning. It says eliminate the provision for sin. What in our lives can we do? It goes back to... Like the drinking. Say you're working on not drinking. Don't go around a bunch of buddies that drink. If your problem is cussing, probably not a good idea to go hang out with a group of sailors. If you know what I mean, people in the Navy aren't bad. There's an expression, so. If you are having marital problems in your life, do not go ask your buddy who's been divorced 17 times for marital advice. Now, I'm not saying that you cannot be divorced and then find someone and have a good, successful relationship. Don't ask someone for marriage advice unless they've been married 15 years or better. Maybe 10, based on the couple, but... Probably not a good idea to go talk to your buddy who is a drinking, cussing hooligan who at the age of 13 has more divorces than he does college credits. Probably not a good idea. Lucky number five, maybe. It'll, blessed number five is the only way that's going to work. 
it, our lives, the things that we do in it, and it, it's funny that God kept putting stewardship on my heart this morning because that's what a lot of this boils down to. The choices that we make, we have, are, are we going to be good stewards of it? In each and every choice, every little thing that God puts in front of us, how are we going to steward that? Who in here has a problem with sin? Each and every one of us. And God gives us a choice each and every single day. Sometimes with the same thing, road rage, that we're challenged with all the time. Sometimes with something new. But the word says it's common to man and he's given us a way out and he will not tempt us. We won't be tempted beyond our means. What we can't do is start looking at the world. When I, when I start thinking about my road rage and the words that come out in those moments, I cannot look at the rest of the world and say, well, I don't drink. I don't, I don't beat my wife. I don't beat my kids. I don't talk ugly to them. I, I do a lot at church. I volunteer and coach a team. It'll be all right. No. Comparison, we've got to realize that comparison's a dangerous, dangerous, bad thing. Don't be looking at man, be looking at God, and we all fall short. When we think about Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewal. That's going to lead us into this next part. What is in our thoughts in our minds that should not be there. And I promise you, this is where this battle starts. The good thing about it is God can see and hear our thoughts, right? Can Satan? No, he is not God. He can't get in there. So we have that protection, but at the same time, we need to realize any, we're not responsible for every thought that pops in our head. But again, back to the stewardship thing, we have the choice. What do we do with it? Do we meditate on it? Do we think about it? Do we let it stay? Do we let it fester? Or do we reject it in the name of Jesus right then and there? That's the renewing of our mind. That's having the word of God in your heart. And when that idea hits there, being able to go somewhere, if nowhere else, prayer, and get it out. But if we let something sit in our mind long enough, eventually it will come out in word or action. No, no two ways about it. If you concentrate on something, if you stick it in your head, it's going to come out in word or action. We can be assured of that. Second Corinthians 10 5 talks about take, taking every thought captive. And we, we've got to realize in the spiritual warfare that, that we're in, in the battle that we face each and every day, if we will take every thought captive and give it to God, it makes it that much easier to walk the way He tells us to. It makes it that much easier not conform to the world. When you hear about a couple that's having marriage problems, what do the lost, what does the world, and what do sympathetic sinning Christians say to those people? Do, do, do what makes you happy. You're not happy. You hadn't been happy for years in that marriage. Be done with it. It's too hard. That's not the answer that we need to seek what God has for us in that. We need to seek what the word has to say about that. We have to take it captive. What we allow to stay in our head will eventually come out in word and action. There's, have, we ever, have we ever really stopped and thought about that? Like if something hits your head that shouldn't, and we just kick it out right then. And if it comes back, we kick it out right back then. It becomes that much easier to deal with, right? How easy is it to deal with like this, this 
pestery fly. Every time it shows up, you just swat it off, swat it away. Not a big deal, right? Presley would be going, she'd be really excited if she was in here. What if that fly's a murder hornet? How, how much more scary does that become to deal with? And I realize this, it's a horrible illustration. But when an idea hits our mind, that's all it is at first. It's this little itty-bitty seed. We can kick it out, or we can give it good fertile soil and give it some water and let it establish itself. And God gives us a way out before that ever happens. What are we going to do with it? Who in here, and praise Jesus, thank God, this is not anything that I struggle with, but have. Who in here has had impure thoughts go through their minds? And, and I'm not just talking about the, the easy, right out front, obvious answer of, you know, sexual immorality. I'm, I'm not just talking about that. That's, that's an easy one, right? Pornography, impure thoughts. If you look upon a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. I, I'm, that, that's the easiest, obvious answer. But the, the little things that we don't think about, the little things, the, I, I, like I said, me and Kimberly have grown quite a bit in, in a short amount of time, and she was way more Christian mature than me early on. And, I, you know, I'd come home with a movie that I just thought was hilarious. And she'd be like, that doesn't need to be in this house. Like, what is wrong with you? You know, I mean, it, it wasn't glorifying God, but it wasn't, it wasn't against God either. But she got on to me, and as, as time passed, I, I just remember one day going through the movie shelf that we have, and, man, y'all, I'm, I'm ashamed to admit, I bet I threw away like 30 or 40 movies that were bad. Well, here's the problem. I still have a mind. I still have a memory. And when someone says or does something that reminds me of something in a bad movie— I'm that idiot that sits there and quotes. I can quote a movie all day. And guess what? Half the movies I quote are not movies I should be quoting. But that's where the normalcy of this stuff comes into play, that we don't realize, that we don't see, that when we're not spiritually awake and spiritually looking at things, that these are the things that start leaning us that way and giving it power. When all this political nightmare of a year 2020 got going, one of the first thoughts I had and told Kimberly was the news and, and everybody else, as far as the socialists are going, they want to push so far and so extreme to one way. Okay, so here we are, right? Here's us. Here's our thoughts. Here's what we believe. Here's how we feel. Let's get them thinking all this over here. Let's get them, let's be this extreme out in front for the world to see. Can anyone see that? Anyone who's watched the news, paid attention, can we see that they're being this extreme and this just obvious backwards? Evil is good, good is evil. This don't look bad. Right here looks a whole lot better than right there. Yeah, we'll take that. The thoughts that we have in our mind, if we do not take them captive, we will begin to compromise. And you're a fool if you think it's not happening. Not even talking about just in the world, not talking about just in the country. I'm talking about in the church, in the body of Jesus Christ. Compromise has happened. We are becoming more and more and more accepted and accepting of the culture. 
why this right here, what we allow to stay in our head, what we allow to be in our thoughts. Look, there's, it's, it's not a bad idea to watch a little bit of the news, listen to a little bit of the news, stay informed so that, so that you know what to pray about. But if it is your life, if it is everything that you do, if every Facebook or feed or Twitter, Instagram, all that junk, if that's all you're doing, that stuff, it gets easier and easier to see. It gets easier and easier to hear. We need to reject it. We need to take every thought captive. As far as my road rage goes, I need to take every driving offense captive. If I would learn how to, when someone cuts me off, instead of doing something negative, if I would, even in an angry way, say, mm, Jesus Christ, bless them to drive better. Is that going to become easier to deal with? Is that going to become easier to accept? Ray's talked about this a lot more than I have, and it's, and it's something that I'm learning I need to do. Waking up and putting on the armor of God and starting my day with God right then and there. We understand that what we, what we give our thoughts to, what we give our actions to, that's what we care about, right? It's easy to see where someone's heart lies. For the, these kids that I'm coaching, man, it's, it's awesome. I, I loved basketball so much when I was young, and it, and it blessed me to, to be able to get back to that. I mean, it really, God knew what he was doing. It, it brings me joy to help out these young men. And the most awesome thing is that I'm doing it up at Legacy. We, we finish every practice with prayer. And it's not about the things that we're trying to teach these young gentlemen is not about basketball. It's about life. To relate that to what we're talking about today, you can see the kids who genuinely try and genuinely have their heart in it and are working. We've talked about it here on Sunday mornings. If this is the only time of the week that you have your Bible open, if this is the only time of week that you are dedicating to let God speak to you, you are wasting your time and you are wasting mine. I'm not, I'm not that good. What I have to say on Sunday morning ain't going to sustain you for a week or anyone. We have got to have some Jesus each and every day. Let's start the day with him. Let's pray throughout the day when things get hard. When things are good, let's glorify him and offer him our praise and thanksgiving. If we will keep our mind on Jesus, there's not room for the bad stuff to make its way in. It's the same thing that, I, that we've talked about with these kids this week. If you want to get better at basketball, the hour and a half that we spend here together on Tuesdays and Fridays ain't going to cut it. You're going to have to get to work outside this place. Three-fourths of y'all are bad, 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 out of shape. Get to work. How many of us are spiritually out of shape? How many of us, if we, for those who don't know, a suicide in the game of basketball, in a practice, is starting at the baseline, running to the free throw line and back, half court and back, the far free throw line and back, full court and back. I give the kids 35 seconds to get this done. There might be two or three that get it done. It's going to take them working on the days that they're not there in order to get that. Jesus Christ, the Almighty, the Creator, has set things in front of us that we can achieve, that we can do. It takes us doing something about it. We talked earlier a little bit during praise and prayer request. It's better to be prayer, 
prayed up and, and ready and prepared before this crisis happens, right? And we read, we read this morning that God will not allow us to go through anything that we, that we can't handle. That's too much for us. If we'll really think about that for a second, holy moly, what is God calling the church to do in the year 2020? Think about that. When we go to prayer here in a little bit, pray about that because that's awesome. The year 2020 looks bleak, looks awful, looks hopeless. He's not going to put us through anything and dare to say that we can't make it through, but that we can't glorify him and do something radical for him through it. Granny, have and I'm, I'm just asking because you've got the most wisdom, not the most years, the most wisdom. Have you seen a year as bad as 2020? Worldwide, not not to you personally. No. Matt, have you seen a year worse than 2020 worldwide? Gene, have you seen a year as bad as 2020 in, in your years? No. Three no's from some wise and experienced people. To me, that means the calling on what we are supposed to do is going to be awesome. It's going to be huge. It's going to be biblical. It's going to be massive and have a massive impact on the kingdom of God. But it starts with this, what we're talking about. What's in your head is going to come out in word and action. We need to be thinking about the things of Jesus Christ. We need to be seeking Jesus Christ. We need to be removing the clutter and the unclean and the impure from our lives. And there's nothing too silly about it. Because it's real. The spiritual battle is real. And it gets down to that detail. Give the devil an inch... And he will take a mile if you let him. Realize that each and everything that comes in our heads, head has kingdom impact. It's really, really, really easy to... How many people in this situation... Fletcher, we're going to put you on the spot. You're fresh, fresh married. Lady comes up to you while you're on your break at Tyson. Hey, let's go out to the parking lot and talk. What do you say, sir? Whoa! She <laughs> For those of you who didn't hear, Cheyenne said, what would you say? No, the answer is no. Not only do you not sin, you do not give the provision for sin. I learned at the police academy, perception is reality. Perception is reality. As ugly as it may seem, I had a, a co-worker that needed a ride home one evening. Her house was somewhat on the way to my house. I'd have to go a little bit out of my way, but... She said, hey, will you, will you give me a ride home? And I said, no, I won't. She said, what? You're, you're a pastor. You're a man of God. I said, yeah, I am. I'm not going to give you a ride home. I said, I'll make sure you get home. I can, I can find means for you to get home. I'm not giving you a ride home. Why? I said, it doesn't look right, and I'm not going to. I'm not going to, nothing at all would happen, but I'm not going to allow someone to say something that they think might happen. Sure enough, I called another coworker that lived right there in town. Hey, can you come give this person a ride home? Yeah, no problem. It's easy. It's easy, easy, easy when we will just kick it out 
and I don't care if it seems ugly, mean, extreme. I do not. I want to live for Christ. And if, and if it means being that way, so be it. When did the church of Christ become so scared to be the church of Christ? Who gives us power and authority to operate? The Lord, not the world. We do not need permission from anyone to be the church of Jesus Christ. Men, you do not need permission from the world to be a kingdom man. Women, you do not need permission from the world to be a kingdom woman. We do not need permission from the world to be raising up Christian children who will have an impact on the kingdom someday. Young men and women of the kingdom. We don't need permission for that. We have got to get serious. We've got to. And, I, and I'm sorry, I keep telling Kimbo, one of these weeks I'm going to preach a, a good, happy message. I really want to. We're not awake. We've gone to conference, a conference called The Awakening, and guess what? We're not awake. I don't mean that necessarily as individuals in here, even, even corporately as our church, but the church of Christ, whom this is going to take, has got to wake up, get outside the four walls and roof, and do something. And it starts in taking every thought captive, starting our day with him, and living in this. Again, removing what needs removed. Who are we given power and authority to operate in our lives? It needs to be the Lord. What's keeping us from it? Is it something in our house? Is it our house? Is it something in our car? Is it our car? I don't. Now, I know, I know without a shadow of a doubt we have people in here that have done this. But if you haven't, this week, take the time. Take some anointed oil and anoint your house. Go to each corner. Go to each doorway. Pray over it and be willing to protect it. We're in a spiritual battle, and I definitely feel in the last few weeks like God has told me we had better get ready and get in shape because it's about to get real. I want my house to be a, a place to go. I want it to be a stronghold for the things of the Lord. I want it to be somewhere where when the wheels fall off this thing. Has anyone ever noticed that? You have certain friends that you will not hear from for two years. And then all of a sudden when the wheels fall off, hey, Ray, man, I, I really need you. We need to be prayed up and be ready for it because here in the future, we're, we're going to be those people. We're gonna, we are going to be those people who people are going to run to, who people are going to cling to. We have to remember to be prepared and prayed up before it happens. We, have, we need to realize that there's no temptation that we cannot defeat. We will not be tempted beyond our means, beyond what God gives us as he gives us an escape so that we can endure it. And we need to realize when we get there, it's not about our perfection. It is pretty simple. Share them this and point to that. We're not going to be perfect. We don't have to be. We're not called to be. I pray that in this time of prayer we're getting ready to have, pray about taking your thoughts captive. Think about the things that swirl through your head each and every day that you allow to stay there. Think about the things that are in your house. We've, taught, we've prayed about this the last couple weeks, and maybe this is why it was leading up to this. Pray about whatever that one thing may be that's holding you back from a fuller relationship with Jesus Christ.